So glad to see all of you here in the house of the Lord. My, it's good to be here. You glad you're here? Say amen. amen. Wonderful. I'm glad to be here for sure, and I am glad to see all of you here. My, 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 thank God for the wonderful privilege to come into his house and worship him on this beautiful day that God has blessed us with. The psalmist said, I was glad. Aren't you glad he said that? I'm glad he said that. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Oh, I can remember when I was a boy, daddy said, let's go to church. Let's go, y'all boys, get ready. And, of course, he didn't have to say it much. We already knew it, him being a pastor and all. We knew we was going to church, but uh, people talk about being drugged to church, being drugged, drugged, drugged about everywhere, and we, we always knew we was going to church, but... I thank God for it, boy, it's done a lot in my life, and I thank God for what it's still doing in my life, and I thank God for the privilege to fellowship with God's people in his house. What an honor, what a joy, and what a blessing it is to come and uh, be with you all and to hear about what God is doing, how he's helping us, what he's done for us this week, and the prayers he's answered, the needs he's meeting. And, of course, the challenges in all of our lives. I'm glad God still knows how to meet those, aren't you? We serve an awesome God. We really do. Let's pray together. Ask him to meet with us today. He's already here, but ask him to have his way in our own hearts. That's what he wants to do. And as he uh, meets with us, that we would surrender and let him guide us and speak to us in a real way. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for the privilege, Lord, to come and meet and assemble ourselves together and what you want to do in our hearts and lives today. Well, thank you, Lord, for the good meeting we've had already this morning. My, our brotherhood was so blessed this morning with such a great challenge from Brother Jimmy, and I want to thank you, Lord, for him and his dedication to bring your word. And then, Lord, Sunday school hour and the time together as we look into your word and glean from it. And now, Lord, for the time to worship you. I want to thank you, Lord, for each one who's here. You know our hearts, you know our minds, you know everything. And I'm glad you're able to help us, Lord, to focus on you these next few minutes to just glorify you. There's so many things that are happening in the world around us, but, Lord, we need you. And we need, Lord, to center in on worshiping you and honoring you and glorifying you. You've been so good to us in so many ways. There's so many people in our world that are hurting and that need you, and Lord, sometimes we're them. And I'm glad you know how to speak to us, and you know how to meet our needs, and to touch us in such a real way. Be that, Lord, to us today, and we'll thank you and praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen, amen. Remind you, of course, our evening worship service tonight at 6, 6 o'clock tonight right here and kids blast tonight at six don't forget that of course our wednesday night prayer meeting bible study uh, we're having a good time looking into the word of god on wednesday night seven o'clock don't forget that as well all right amen brother daniel's gonna come we just send some good singing and we're just gonna go to meeting this morning come on brother amen
Let's all stand as the choir comes down. field now ripened there's a work for all to do hark the voice of God is calling to the harvest calling you little is much when God is in it labor not for wealth or fame there's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it and he'll not forget his own little is much when god is in it labor not for wealth or fame there's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in jesus name when we enter heaven's portals and our savior's face we see cares of life will be forgotten we'll be happy glad and free little is much when god is in it labor not for wealth or fame there's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in jesus name good song. My, what a great reminder to our hearts today. Little as much when God is in it. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, open them to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. I'm interested in one verse there as a springboard to get us started today. And then I want to look at several verses or several thoughts, I guess you would say, from this one verse. And dealing with several different things this week, several different uh, incidences, several different things in my own life that got me thinking, I guess, about this subject and got me started on this uh, thought uh, that God has laid on my heart for us today. A uh, good thought, a uh, positive thought, a very profound thought that we all need and must look at it sometime or another in our lives, but it's much needed in our society today. If you're able and can stand with me, I want to look at this one verse, Second Corinthians chapter number 5. You know this verse, you've read this verse, you've heard this verse, but I want us to look at it and examine maybe it or the context of it or not uh, this, uh, or look at this verse and see what it is saying to us and analyze it for a few moments. The Bible says here, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, of course, he's referring to a lot of things he said in chapter number 5. I'm not going to look on all of them, but he's talking about the very fact that the Lord Jesus has died, uh, buried, rose again, the gospel. If any man be in Christ, 
accepted him as his personal savior, him or her as his personal savior, mankind. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, Heavenly Father, I ask that you would open to us this, your word, your holy word. And this verse that Paul wrote many, many years ago, but yet, Lord, is so powerful, so relevant for us today. And, Lord, it means so much that we understand it today and that it is so real to each one of us today. Help us, Lord, bring it alive to our hearts and use it to speak to us today. And we'll praise you that for all that is accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As you look at this verse and what it is asking or what it is saying, the profound statement that it makes, it is amazing as you analyze it. And I want to use it for a few moments and ask it, uh, I guess, what it says to all of us in a statement to our lives. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, if he's in Christ, if something has happened in his life, he is a new creature. I am thankful that that has happened in my life. You've got to ask yourself, when you look at that and analyze that verse and analyze that uh, context of what that verse is saying, you, you, you ask yourself the profound question, am I truly a child of God? Am I truly in Christ Jesus? And what does that mean? Are you a saved person? Are, we use that terminology so many times as we're talking to people, and uh, many times they don't understand what we're talking about. I talked to a girl this morning uh, a little after 1 o'clock right out here in my driveway, and I was talking to her and trying to explain to her and trying to make sure she understood what it means to be in Christ Jesus. And I was already working on this uh, subject, working on this sermon when uh, our lives crossed this morning. I've been talking to other people this week and trying to get them to understand if God has truly saved you, you have what we understand to be a testimony. What that means is if you were called to testify in a court of law, you would give what has happened to you in an incident or something you know as a witness. We call it witnessing or we call it testifying. It's a testimony to what you know has transpired in an event or something that has happened in your life pertaining to something that has happened around you or to you. That is a witness. That is a testimony. What I'm interested in to, today is where you are in Christ and how that pertains to your testimony, your witness. If I ask you to give your testimony, your life story concerning you in Christ Jesus, what would that look like? What would that entail? What would be your life story? How would you share that? How would you convey that? That is so important in the life of a child of God. It's so important. Paul says, if you're in Christ Jesus, there has been a change take place. You're a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Perhaps you're wondering where to begin. Where, where would I start? Now, many times I started my own personal testimony with my birth when I got born into this world and i talk about my earthly dwelling of how i was born in a preacher's home but that didn't save me that didn't change my life as far as my eternal destination and of course yours would be different you probably wasn't raised in a preacher's home but i want to deal with that question and answer it according to the word of god of what has to happen in a person's life in order for them to make it to their eternal destination of heaven, eternity with God. What has to happen in, in a person's transaction, if I can say it that way, a person's uh, life story for them to make it to heaven as their eternal abode, their eternal destination? What has to happen? I want you to notice with me just two or three thoughts here of what has to happen according to the Scriptures 
of what has to happen in your life story, what happened in my life story, what happened in all of our life story that will help you convey your testimony to someone as you're called upon to witness and be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to see, first of all, that I was a sinner separated from God. Now, I talked about that many years ago when I come back here as pastor. I talked about us being a church that understands our purpose of connecting people to God, understanding that people are separated from God. People don't know God and getting a vision of seeing people where they are and trying to connect them to God. Trying, you see, that's our purpose of God leaving us here is understanding that a world is lost without God, just like I was before I got saved. We were lost and undone without God or His Son, the songwriter said. And of course, that's when Jesus came to my rescue. That's when God opened my eyes to the truth that I was lost without Him. All of our stories, all of our life stories start with the fact that we're sinners. The psalmist uh, said it this way. He said, David said it this way. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive thee. Now, people that don't know the Bible, they read that verse, and they said, Oh, well, his mother must have been an awful, sinful woman. No, that's not what that means at all. His mother must have been doing something awful, awful. Ill. Oh, she must have been a woman of ill repression. Oh, no, 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 no. What he's literally saying there, of course, that doesn't mean that David's mom was doing something, living in an erroneous lifestyle of sin. No, no, no. What he's literally saying is his mother, of course, in sin, he was brought into this world with a sinful nature. All of us were. You, you see, you weren't perfect when you were born. Now, if I need to prove that, I'll just talk to you, mom and dad. We won't have to go far, will we? Huh? <laughs> I know, I know when you were first born, especially if you were the first child, Daniel will say amen to this. If you were the first child, I mean, we thought that first child was perfect uh, until they started growing up. Mm -hmm. And then the first child will say uh, the last child was perfect. The baby was perfect. <laughs> if John was here, he would say that about Daniel. Daniel got away with everything, but that, that's not true either. Uh, of course, we know they weren't, and none of us were perfect. I mean, you, you stop and consider that. We all got a sinful nature from our grandparents, great, great, or whatever, how many greats you need to put on there, uh, Adam and our grandmother, granddad Adam and our grandmother Eve, all the way back to them. Because in them, of course, came that sinful nature that we have all inherited. You've heard me say it before. I've never had to teach those boys how to lie or steal or any of those evil things. I've always had to sit them down and try to teach them not to do those things because all those things come natural. Come natural. I was separated from God by sin. I was a sinner by birth. And it didn't take me long to realize that thanks to the godly teaching of my mom and dad the bible tells us romans chapter number three verse number 10 as it is written there is none righteous no not one the bible says for we have all sinned and come short of the glory of god on our best days when we're doing our dead level best we're still not fit creatures for heaven if we were perfect in this world we still wouldn't be fit for that world because this is a sin cursed world you, you see, how oh, I'm telling you, don't look at me spiritually. We all know this. We, we all know we're a sinner. <laughs> and, of course, we all realize. Isaiah said it this way, Isaiah 59, verse number 2. But your iniquities, verse 1 and 2, he said, he, he said your iniquities. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, and neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, your sins have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear you. Sin separates us from a holy God. We realize that sin separates us. The Bible says the wages, the payment for our sins and being sinful creatures is death. That was the pronouncement God made upon sin. Let me stop right there for a moment and say this verse doesn't end there. 
And thank God it doesn't. There's not a period after the wages of sin is death. I've often used this verse in dealing with people and talking to people about our sinful condition. And thank God there's not a period after death. If it was, oh, I'm telling you, we'd be forever condemned to death. But the Bible doesn't stop there. You see, it goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But the wages, the payment for our sin is death. And that's just not six foot under separation physically in death, but that's separation from God for all of eternity death. You see, that's a spiritual death. That's a physical and spiritual death. It's separation. It lasts for all of eternity. None of us want that. You don't want to be eternally separated from God, from your loved ones. None of us want that, but there's good news. You see, that the gift of God, God gave us a gift when he gave us his only begotten son. Oh, you don't have to experience eternal death. I want you to know in this message you can experience eternal life. We call it, God calls it that, with him. And you can experience it for all of eternity. I I want you to understand that. I want you to know. So your life story ought to include the fact that I was once a sinner. I was a sinner separated from God. There was nothing I could do, nothing within me I could do to save myself. And I realized that. I come to grips with that. It was a haunting feeling. I can remember laying in my bed at night thinking, if I die, I'll wake up in hell. It haunted me. It scared me. Oh, yes. But then I want you to notice I was saved through the Son of God. That's a a very enlightening, very encouraging thought. But it's often misunderstood. And some people look at salvation as just something you put on or something now. The Bible does attribute it that we put on Christ, and he's talking about righteousness after we've been saved. Put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says in one place, he's talking about the righteousness as we're following through with salvation. He's not talking about the act of being saved there. He's talking about following through in obedience to Christ. But some people think of it as what? It's like putting on the Sunday go to meet and shoes. You ever thought about that? Well, I've been saved. I put the Sunday go to meet and shoes on, and then when I get to the house, I take them off. And I don't wear them through the week. And then I get them out when I need them and put them back on. And look at salvation that way. I got saved. I got me a pair of Sunday go to meet and shoes. And I get them out when I need them. That's not salvation, my friend. That's a terrible, dangerous thought if you look at salvation that way. That's not what the Bible talks about in salvation. It's a dangerous thing. You see, when you read about God's word and his definition of real salvation, Jesus said he wanted to be a part of your life. No, 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 that's not what the Bible says. That's the way some people look at it, that Jesus is a part of my life, just like a pair of Sunday shoes or just like a a coat you put on on Sunday and then you take him off, hang him in the closet, and then when you need him, you go back and get him, put him on. Oh, if I get desperate, I'll put him on through the week. I'll get him out when I need him. No, no, no. That's not salvation at all. Look at this verse, Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 4. The Bible says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. It doesn't say when Christ, who is a part of your life. It says, Who is your life? You see, that's who Christ really is. When he becomes your Savior, he becomes your Lord. He is your all in all. That's what the Bible teaches. That's the only thing it teaches about Jesus, too. The only way it teaches him about salvation. He's Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Who is the Lord of your life? When Christ, when Christ, who is your life, he says. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be In Christ, not part of Christ, in Christ. You're in Christ. He is a new creature. Old things passed away. Adrian Roger used to say Christianity is not a cafeteria line. That you go through and say, well, I'll take a little bit of Sunday worship over here and a little bit of, uh, no, I don't want all that. I don't want all that, uh, all that other stuff. I'll just take a little bit of what I want. No, no, no. It's not a cafeteria style. I have a little bit of salvation, but no lordship of Christ. No, no, no. He's either Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. 
You see, he is your Lord and Savior. Maybe you hear it today and you're wondering, how does this happen? How do I get to a place of where Jesus can save me? Well, if you're ready, he's ready. He's speaking to your heart. You think uh, for a second that you're a sinner and you can clean up your life somehow or another and get to the point where uh, you're ready. Uh, it don't happen that way. Romans chapter 5, verse number 8, the Bible says, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. You don't get clean enough to get saved. You don't clean up enough to get saved. You come just as you are. Realizing there's not enough good works you can do. So many people are trying their way to work their way to heaven, trying their way to clean up enough to get ready for God. It don't happen that way. You see, there's not enough good we can do. The Bible says, behold, all things are new. The old man's gone, behold, all things are new. That's talking about a change of heart. That's talking about a change that the Holy Spirit of God produces through the conviction of sin. You realize you can't save yourself. We're born, we're born sinners, all of us. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 3 and verse number 7, you must be born again, he told Nicodemus. You must be born again. You must be born again. It has to be a change take place in your life. Repentance is required. And the Bible says only those who repent, turn from their sin, and turn to the Savior, experience a real change in their life, a real change in their heart. Jesus said on one occasion in Luke chapter 5 and verse number 32, I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. You see, it's those who recognize that they're sinners that have come to the Savior. He talked about that repentance and remission of sin. No repentance, N-O repentance, leads to N-O forgiveness. But when you start understanding the N-K-N-O-W, repentance, you understand the knowledge that you have to repent. You understand the K-N-O-W of forgiveness. You'll know forgiveness. And it's through the Lord Jesus Christ. People who really want to benefit from, uh, of course, uh, understanding about this real forgiveness. Now, some people don't. They don't, they don't understand that. You, you know what it's like? It's like wanting the rewards and the benefits of retiring, working for a company and retiring from a company and understanding and having the, the rights of all that without ever going to work for them. Can you imagine that? Well, I want them to send me a check every month. Well, you ain't never went to work for them. You don't even know them. They ain't even got you on payroll. But you're expecting to receive some type of reward from them. Some people look at God that way. You expect to come down to the end of your life's road and you're expecting God to give you something and you don't even know him. You've never even given your heart and life to him. But yet you're expecting him to give you heaven and all the rewards of it. Some people look at it as the rights and the benefits and the retirement of maybe a veteran who's never once put on a uniform or never once served a day in the services. And yet they're expecting somehow God to reward them. But he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. You've never served one day for the Lord. You've never given your life one day to him. But yet you want to claim that. Many people look at it that way. They want to name the name of Christ. They want to say I'm this or that. But they're not. See, many people say that. Well, I, I'm a Christian. You are. When did you accept the Lord as your personal son? Well, I've been a Christian all my life. That's just not true. You've heard me say this before. I've talked to many people that's told me this though, over the years. No one is a Christian all of their life. Now, they may have been a Christian the majority of years of their life. They may have been saved when they were young. Like me, I've been a Christian most of my life. That is, I, I had a salvation experience when I was young. And for the majority of the years of my existence here on, on planet Earth, I have known the Lord as my personal Savior. But I have not been a Christian all of my life. No one has. There had to be a place. There had to be a time. There had to be a moment when we were saved. 
That is, trusted the Lord as our personal Savior. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. You see, repentance is required. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the Bible goes on to say, that for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now watch this verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. According to God's word, repentance is required for salvation. It don't just come natural. It don't just come automatic. There's something when God begins to woo in our heart, when God reveals to us that we are a sinner and we need him, we must repent. Of our sins. We must confess that we are sinners. Salvation isn't earned. It isn't by works. There are so many people on planet earth. Think if I get good enough. God will just love me. And when that day comes. I'll reason with God. I'll tell him he'll understand it. You think that's really going to happen? No it's not. No it's not. You think God would be fair in doing that? It would be the same analogy I've just given you. Oh no. It's not going to happen. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man shall boast. Titus 3, and verse number 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. You see, repentance and faith are inseparable when it comes to salvation. Being saved, oh, I'm telling you, is it part of your story? Is it part of your testimony? Can you honestly say there's been a place and a time where you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ by faith and you have been changed by the power of God? You know you've been saved. I was saved through the Son of God. That's how I've been changed. The Bible said if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you can be saved. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Oh, I'm so glad of that. I'm so glad anybody can come to the Lord Jesus and be saved, aren't you? It includes surrender. It includes confessing. It includes a Savior that will set you free. Here's the third thing that should be included in your testimony. I... I'm being changed. I was changed and I'm being changed by the word of God. You see, when the word of God becomes relevant in our lives, there's an amazing thing that happens in our lives. You, you, you notice the word of God changes us. You begin a journey with the Lord. The word of God changes us. When we see the word of God happening in our life, it begins a change it changes us, and it begins a change to continue changing us. You ever notice that? You fall in love with the Word of God. And here he talks about it. I've been saved. I know the Lord. Uh, but for some reason, he don't speak to me anymore. Oh, has it become dull? You think God's mad at me? You think he's forgotten me? You think he doesn't love me? No, no. When's the last time, uh, when's the last time you read and studied and meditated on the Word of God? Has it been a long time? You see, hearing from God is like hearing, uh, hearing, of course, from someone you haven't heard from in a while. Have you forgot his voice? Or maybe he's told you something and you haven't done what he told you to the last time. The Bible is a gift from God. You ever really thought about the Bible like that? It's a gift. Sometimes you don't open it. You don't know what's in it. You hadn't opened that gift. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. It's amazing what the word of God will do when you stop and study it and read it and let God use it to speak to us. I read it many times as I study it and prepare to give things to you out of it. But many times I just read it and say, Lord, just speak to me. It's amazing how God speaks to me. Think about that. This is God's voice. It's his wisdom. It's his instruction for my life. He's the authority one. 
He's the one that's in charge of everything. He's the one that created everything. And when you say God intends for it to change us, our eternal destination, put us on the right course of getting there. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies to live in sacrifice. Now, many people say, I'd die for the Lord. God don't want you to die for him. He wants you to live for him. A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse number 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. There it is. God will renew your mind. He'll change the way you think. He'll change how you think, what you think about. So many people are depressed. So many people are in, going in the wrong direction because they're thinking about the wrong things, because their mind's on the wrong things, because they're not being renewed in their mind. He says, be not conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I can't find the will of God. Are you in the word of God? God will show you his will. You get in his word. It's amazing what happens. Transformation takes place. Renewing your mind happens when you read and digest and apply the word of God. It's amazing what happens. You know what happens? Watch this. I'll give you four things that happen when you get in the word of God and you start reading and studying the word of God. You'll find the word of God is a compass. It'll guide you. It's a compass. It's a compass to us. Psalms 119, 105. Thy word has a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Literally, it'll light up the way you ought to go. I ask God many times, Lord, show me. Show me which way you want me to go. Lord, help me to discern which way is right. Lord, help me to see what I ought to see, do what I ought to do. So many times I see it right there in the word of God. God will light it up for me. He'll light it up. A lot of people walking in darkness today simply because they're walking without the word of God being their direction. They don't know the truth. They're not reading the word of God. It, it is our compass to guide us. It convicts us. Right there in that verse I give you a while ago, what? It, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He'll convict you about something. He'll show you something. He'll bring you a remembrance, something you read in the word of God. To convict you what? To point you in the right way. It'll transform your mind to prove what is that good and acceptable. How are you going to know what's acceptable? Well, you watch something on TV and you say, well, that's not good. Somebody look at you and say, huh? You didn't see that? You didn't catch that? Why? Your discerner's broke. You what? Your discerner's broke. Get your discerner fixed. Where you get it fixed? Right here in the Word of God. Let the Holy Spirit bring your discerner alive. You start discerning things, what they're trying to do to our children, what they're trying to do in our world. It'll wake you up. Conviction, you see, and to cleanse us. It'll help compass us. It'll help convict us. It'll help cleanse us. Psalms 119, verse number 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. These verses I read last week, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now watch it. Don't stop there that he might sanctify and cleanse it uh, with the washing of water by the word. The word has a powerful impact of cleansing us. It does something to us. It'll clean us up. Here's the last thing. It commands us. The word of God will command us. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3, 16, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Oh, I'm telling you how the word of God can help us. Oh, it'll lead us. It'll, it'll compass us. It'll show us which way we need to go. Guide us. It'll convict us. It'll cleanse us. It'll command us. Oh, aren't you glad of that? Here's the last thing that ought to be in your testimony. And that is number four. I'm or I've been made new by the spirit of God. Is that true in your life? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I'm being made new. Oh, I'm not what I ought to be, songwriter said. But thank God I'm not who I used to be. I'm being changed every day by the renewing of the Holy Ghost in my life. I'm letting him have more of me every day. Are you letting him have more of you? 
I'm becoming new every day. The old man is passing away. The new man is becoming new. How do you know that, preacher? How do you know you're becoming more spiritual? How do you know you're becoming more of God's disciple? How do you know you're becoming more like him? Jesus said it this way to his disciples. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be by disciples. Bearing fruit. Bearing fruit. Now, most people look at that and they think of, witnessing and bringing people to Jesus. But it's talking about bearing fruit in your life, and that is true. That is true, witnessing. But it's more than passing out tracts and witnessing to people everybody, every time you run into somebody saying, are you a Christian, and handing them a tract. It's more than that. It's living a life in front of them that they see you're a Christian. They know there's something different about you. And here's a good way to understand that, okay? Watch this now. Stay with me. Don't get mad at me. Okay, stay with me. I'm not going to do it. I promise you I'm not going to do it. But if we were, if we were to select two or three people at whoever, we were to select five or ten questions concerning a spiritual life, and we were to go to your job at random, people you work with every day, are... Uh oh, your home, <gasps> people you live with every day, <gasps> and we would ask them, is this person a Christian? Do they have the traits of a child of God? Are they bearing the fruit of a child of God? Oh, my. Now, some people would be judgmental. I understand that. They would be quick to say, well, I've watched them get mad. Did they act like a worldly person or a godly person when they got mad? Are they showing forth the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Are they showing forth the fruit of the world? Hold me. Now, you, 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 you go ahead. It's okay. See, I, I'm having to hear this twice. God's already been convicting me about it. Oh, my. Oh, God, Lord, please. Are you kidding? Oh, Lord, please don't send them over to my house. Don't ask Sister Karen. Now, don't ask my dogs. I got one that keeps toting the bowl off. I threatened to beat him this week. I have yet to touch him. Uh, he's not even my dog. He's a stray that come up. I wouldn't dare hurt him, but, boy, I, like, I don't like it. I don't like him toting the bowl off. Boy, just because it's empty don't mean you need to tote it off. I'll keep putting food in it. Come on. You're not even my dog, but I'm taking care of you. Don't you understand that? And I think about God convicted me and thought about, yeah, that's the way they treat me too, the Lord said. I take care of them, and they keep running off and don't even appreciate it. Yeah. Look at this parable. Let me just read the verses. I'm done. Matthew chapter 13. You know this parable. Verse 24, another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares. Now, tares are something that looked like wheat, but they're different. They're weeds among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up, it's bringing it up, they're coming up out of the ground, and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. These weeds come up right beside the wheat. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? What's these weeds doing among your wheat? Now look at verse 28. He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto them, him, wilt thou then that we should go and gather them up? Watch what he said. But he said, nay, lest while ye be gathering up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reaper, Gather ye first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat 
into my barn. You notice what he said? He said, just let them grow. Just let them grow. Just let them go and let them grow. The wheat in the tares. You, you notice what the difference was? You notice what the difference was? They're both growing. And they both look very similar. Until harvest. And you know how they told the difference? One's bearing fruit and one's not. One's bearing fruit. One of them's got wheat on it and the other one don't. And the reapers, the, the servants said, hey, wait a minute. We got some weeds in there. You want us to go in there and tear them weeds out, them folks that ain't bearing no fruit? And the master said, no. No, you, you, you tear up too much trying to do that. Just wait till harvest. Wait till harvest time. Some of us are wheat, we're saved, we're surrendered, we're sanctified. That means set apart, doing what God wants us to do. And some are weeds. It's apparent by what? The fruit. The fruit. Should I go up and pull them up? He said, no. No. Verse 30, let them grow together into a harvest. Let them grow to, to a harvest. You may be thinking, but if you're truly saved, what, what's the problem, preacher? Are you truly saved? That is the question. That is the testimony of these questions. That is the qu testimony of I, am, uh, I was a sinner separated from God. I was saved through the Son of God. And then I've, I've been changed. I am being changed by the Word of God. And I've been and am being changed by the Spirit of God, being made conformable unto the Son of God. The main question is 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 5. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, and prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates? You, you have to answer that question. I can't answer that question. You have to answer that question. But it's the most important question. Why? Because it's the difference between where you will spend eternity. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. They're coming with a song. A time of invitation. We're going to stand in a moment and we're going to sing. I want you to examine yourselves. Test yourself whether you be in the faith. Ask yourself that question. Don't let pride, don't let nothing stand in your way. But ask yourself that question, am I truly saved? Has there been a time in my life when I realized I was a sinner separated from God? And there was a time when I was saved through the Son of God. It's the only way you get saved, through Him. Jesus made it clear, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Have I been changed by the Word of God? Is it still changing me? Does it still have effect on me? You may be here today and you know you've been saved. You know there's been a transformation take place in your life. But somehow the word of God is not still having an effect on you. You're cold and indifferent toward the things of God. The spirit of God, is he still ruling and reigning? Is he still having his way to lead God and direct you? Maybe you've grown cold and indifferent. Oh, I'm glad I'm still being changed by the spirit of God. He's conforming me to the image of his dear son. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to stand and sing. If God's spoken to your heart today, will you do business with him? It's the most important thing you'll do. Do business with the Lord. Stay connected to him. Be right with him. We never know when we're going to leave this world. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Help us now in this invitation time. Help it to be between you and me, Lord Jesus. Each one of us, help us to say that and have your will and your way. And we'll praise you for all that's accomplished in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. We're standing. We're singing. If God's spoken to your heart, will you come? Come on. Come on.